Hi, this is Glenn Lowry of The Glenn Show, host of The Glenn Show. As you know, I'm professor of economics at Brown University, and I am a visiting, distinguished visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution, and I'm happy to welcome you to this week's episode of The Glenn Show. A little bit out of order, a little bit unusual again. Frankly, friends, I'm using this period to try to finish up the work on my memoir draft and um, am uh, therefore stepping back a little bit from my engagement with the Glenn Show, but please bear with me. Um, I will be back in full force soon enough this week. Um, I am offering you a conversation between myself and Nikita Petrov. And Nikita Petrov is the very talented and uh, creative um, manager of the Glenn Show's uh, production activities. He's also a podcaster in his own right. He has a show called Psychopolitica, which you can find at bloggingheads.tv. And he and I, for his show, uh, had a conversation about the great questions that occurred to him after a psychedelic experience. What's going on and what is to be done? Uh, I hold forth on those questions at length, so you get your dose of Glenn this week. Uh, but the show has already posted at Nikita's uh, uh, platform, and I'm reposting it here. I do hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Okay, and as you say, we are underway. Um, I'm gonna try to set this conversation up in a in a way that's important for me, and I think it'll. Uh, what I want to do is to make it clearer what it is that I'm trying to accomplish, um, and um, and uh, again, in your words, what it is that I'm on behalf of. Not that that's clear to myself. I'm kind of struggling with that part, but uh, as I said uh, just now, when, when we were preparing. I think this is a challenge I need to be facing. So, so the full story, the, the way this conversation came about, I, I didn't tell you the full story, is that I, a few months ago, had a psychedelic experience, which is something that I do every once in a while, uh, with a substance known as DMT, which is one of the most intense psychedelics that is out there. But it's also part of the human, normal human metabolism. So the body knows exactly what to do with the compound. It breaks down very easily. And so what ends up happening is you have a very intense 15 minutes uh, that then leave you speechless and you need to re-examine what it is that is happening to you in light of this experience. And I thought of you right after the trip uh, sitting on my couch thinking, you know, what do I do with this now? And uh, I'm not going to try to describe the experience, uh, at least not at this juncture, because uh, that would be too complicated and I'm not sure I'm going to make much sense. But I'll tell you why you came up in my mind after the thing was over. And and it has to do, so the way I've been thinking about it lately is this this experience restated a couple of pretty fundamental questions that can be looked at, addressed uh, at different levels of abstraction. And the questions as I formulate them now are what the hell is going on and what is to be done? And so on one extreme, these are philosophical questions. These, they relate to what is the nature of consciousness? What it is that the human animal is? Uh, how do we connect uh, the what is to be done can be looked at what is free will, is there free will, how much free will do we have, and so forth. And then at the other extreme, these are very particular questions like what is happening in my life or what, how do I connect with the country I'm in, the society I'm in, the, uh, my girlfriend, my family, my friends, and what is to be done again can be translated in some, you know, what do I do on this particular Thursday? What am I trying to accomplish in this conversation we just started? Uh, how my Thursday is going to influence my Friday? And there are levels of abstraction 
where for each of these questions, you came up in my mind, I really thought, you know, I have this opportunity to try to propose a conversation to Glenn. Uh, I should not miss it. And it didn't have to be a public conversation. I think it's better that it's public, but I'm kind of doing it for my own sake to just try to deal with these questions in my life. Uh, and hopefully this is not going to be, you know, a waste of time on your end either. And so with the, what is going on, the reason you came to my mind is there is a certain level of abstraction where it, this question becomes your home turf as a professional. You're an economist. You're, you have these frameworks and models to try to describe and analyze the connections between people, the way we influence one another, the way sometimes this influence is healthy and productive and other times not so much. Uh, there's a particular image that came to mind, which is a gesture you made. I think it was a, a Q&A after an MIT lecture when answering some question from a student, you put your fingers together like this, trying to show this web of interconnectedness in which we're all enmeshed, the family, the peer group, the school, the you know professional field you're in, how would that influence you, influences you, how you influence this network. And so... That's one reason I wanted to talk to you because uh, you have some wisdom to share there. And then on the other question, the what is to be done, it's more personal because I've we've been working together for a few months and I've uh, looked at your project and the way you go about doing it and the way um, you engage with people you work together and just on the personal kind of human being level, I'm impressed and I want to learn things from you. There are things like you're really good at showing gratitude to people who either have done some work for you or wrote a thoughtful message. You know, an audience member leaves a comment that they actually put thought in and you engage with it in a very thoughtful manner that not everybody can do. You seem to be extracting quite a bit of meaning from your own work, uh, from, the, again, the way you engage with uh, this whole enterprise we as humans are engaged in. Um, you seem to have good personal relationships. You sometimes allude to uh, your family life, and you, it seems that you have a strong, healthy, happy, meaningful marriage. And you seem happy. You seem even though you're not necessarily optimistic about the situation we're in, uh, you come to it from a position of strength that seems to be rooted in your own understanding of what you're doing and, and you know, a method of dealing with the situation. And so all of that taken together uh, amount, amounts to the reason I'm, I'm, I'm trying to have this conversation with you because I think... I can learn quite a bit from you. Again, hopefully this is gonna, not going to be a waste of time for you. And then there's, like yesterday I was listening to, I'm halfway through your conversation with Colonel West. And there's something that he said that resonated with me, uh, which was, I'm paraphrasing here, that some of the beauty and value in the way the two of you go about your business is that you're trying to have a relationship with the truth. And if he notices that you're straying away from it, or if you notice that he is exhibiting some hypocrisy in the way he uh, handles himself, you're going to let each other know. You're going to help each other to continue maintaining that relationship with the truth. And I thought, well, that's what I'm trying to do as well, and uh, and again, I think I can benefit from uh, engaging with you uh, if if I go about it the right way. So this is just to set this up. I, I have more specific things to bring up or to ask you, but I'll let you respond to this. If, does it make sense what I just said? And is there is there some resonance? Uh, 
between what I just said and between how you approach what you are doing with the Glenn show and with this, you know, public conversation that you're continuously engaged in. I, I'm so glad we're having this conversation. I really am. It's, it's very gratifying. <laughs> really, uh, because we've, uh, you and I, Nikita, have worked together on producing The Glenn Show for a few months. That's not a long time. Uh, and um, you're, you're going deep. You, you're attentive in, in a very subtle way to, to things. You made so many observations there that warm my heart, that, that gratify me and make me smile. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I want to pat <laughs> myself on the back. You flatter me. Um, I don't know where to begin. A psychedelic experience. So now I know what psychopolitica really means. <laughs> it's one of the meanings for sure, yes. Okay, that's one of the meanings. I had not initially perceived that meaning. Mm -hmm. um, I had more conventional meanings in my, you know, an intersection between psychology and political science, which perhaps the trip is, I don't know. But in any case, so a psychedelic, so then you emerge, you're, you're taking notes while you're on the trip or you, you sit down afterwards and you ask yourself, what, what did I learn? You say you came up with two thoughts and I was attached to both of these thoughts. Um, <laughs> what's going on and what is to be done? And they are, these do seem to be very fundamental questions. It's a good way of putting it. So, um, and then you say some, uh, some very kind things about me, and, and I, I hope that they are true uh, about my marriage and, and about my um, happiness. Uh, I do uh, feel on a mission. I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm hitting my stride again. I, I can remember earlier in my life when I was first becoming a, a scholar, and I was very excited about my research, you know, and I was... You know, it's all I thought and I go to conferences and things like that. And there was a, every day you get up in the morning and, you know, you're, you can't wait to get out of bed and, and start thinking about what you were thinking about before you went to sleep last night. And I almost can feel like that again. I mean, like I was 30 years old and, you know, kind of at the rising edge of something because I feel like I'm at the rising edge of something and I, I don't know quite what it is. So, yeah, yeah. Um, <sighs> I do think that you perceive correctly about economics. I think the queen of the social sciences. Um, I, I, I don't want to be too um, chauvinistic about my discipline among disciplines, but I, I, I was trained very well at a, you know, an elite economics department uh, 40 years ago, 45 years ago. And it has stuck. And um, even though my intellectual interests have broadened and my, you know, my command over various literatures and such has extended, I'm, I, I still come home, you know, and analytically and, you know, in terms of a sense of rigor, a, a, a sense of, um, you know, the, the, the complexity and, and stuff. So... Um, I, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, you, you, you see that, uh, uh, in, in me, uh, and, and appreciate it. Uh, I, I think the Glenn show, you know, where I interview people and whatnot, I, 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 I'm really trying to bring that intellectual cast of mind, that, that, sense of, uh, of, of wanting to be analytical and rigorous to the uh, various questions that we take up, questions that can range far away from the economy per se. So, yeah. And what is to be done? How to live? It's a good question. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's, not a, it's not a straightforward question, is it? Uh, how to mm -hmm. live? Uh, you know, and since I'm working on the memoir, <laughs> and I really am, and I have a September delivery date and a you know early spring publication date next year uh, on the memoir, I've been thinking a lot about uh, self respect. Mm. You know, about uh, because there's this uh, I think there's this problem. Uh, which is the temptation to self-aggrandizement, self-delusion, uh, you, you know, and uh, I, how, to, how to genuinely be honest with oneself. 
Uh, there's another problem which a writer of a memoir is going to have, which is how to persuade a reader that the reader should take seriously what the writer is saying about himself, since the writer has every interest to make his polish his own image, but the credibility of the reader is a precious resource. Uh, uh, and, and that has implications which uh, might not be immediately evident, like discredit, the disclosure of discrediting information is an essential part of the mm -hmm. project of writing about oneself. You want your reader to take you seriously. Uh, disclosing, uh, discrediting information, you, <laughs> you have to discredit yourself. You have to Uh, you know, you have to take some of the things out of the closet and some of the dirty laundry out of the hamper, this kind of thing. But you don't want to delude yourself. And I, I've, uh, I've, been, I've been struggling with that. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of rambling now. Maybe that's what you want. <laughs> I did not take any acid before this interview, however, so my <laughs> ramblings may not be as productive as yours. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure ramblings on acid are necessarily productive. <laughs> okay. you need to, I, I prefer to do it alone and ramble by myself and write things down, and only afterwards you can share something and you need to think, is that shareable or not? And that's, that's a gamble, too. Um, okay, so... There are a number of the directions that I can try to take this in, uh, and here's one. I've alluded in a couple of emails that I sent before this conversation um, to this frame of mind, this, this way of looking at the situation that has become more prominent for me after that experience that I just mentioned. And that is, so in the experience itself, there was this, you know, it's a very as I said, intense, visually rich thing where it has these qualities. It feels like it's very profound and has to do with the core of what is happening here. And yet it's very hard to, as I said, put in words and, and make it, uh, even to yourself, make sense of it. But um, one thing that was very uh, obvious, very like clearly presented to me in that experience is the, the sense of interconnectedness of all things. And uh, that, again, we can look at it from different levels, uh, at different levels, and some of them may be too, you know, more woo than others. Uh, but there's one that I think is, again, connects to what you do to the uh, field of economy, which is the interconnectedness of people that in, there is a, a way of looking at the situation, uh, which is that we are nodes, each of us is a node in a network or a network of networks. And there, is, there are these links between people and there's some kind of a connection. And these connections can be of different uh, kind. And the, the way we influence one another can be of different kinds. And there is a sense, this is what I've been thinking, I was thinking, you know, as I was uh, in the middle of this trip, that I certainly have a feeling, and I think everybody has it, that not everything is right. There are some parts of this, if you look at this, you know, landscape of connections and experiences and events and how they influence you and how you influence them, the, the same kind of, interconnected system of things happening that's within you, some of these, some of the regions of that landscape seem problematic. And the examples that came to mind to me as I was in the middle of this were things in the body. There's a tense muscle, let's say there's, uh, you know, an illness. I clearly see that this is a problem, even though I don't necessarily understand the nature of it. And uh, uh, examples that are, you know, uh, close to a Russian heart are political prisoners, people in jail for what they believe, the police state generally, uh, you know, a cop beating a protester. That's a relationship too. That's a human being connecting with a human being in a certain sense. But that kind of connection seems not the kind that I like. And so I was trying to think of how do I tell a healthy relationship, a healthy connection, a healthy pattern of behavior within the network from an unhealthy one? And again, since I thought of you, I thought of uh, your turf and, uh, you know, you were in this 
sort of ideological battle with uh, an ideology known as the critical race theory or wokeism more generally. And since it, this is not my fight, right? This is not something that I understand through my own engagement with my own environment. I look at it from afar through these, uh, you know, the screen of a computer. Uh, but from following you, I at least can understand your perspective. And so I try to think about that too. And now that I came to a conclusion that would be uh, applicable to all of these things, but but it's interesting for me to try to look for that kind of conclusion. If we're looking at what we're engaged in as the system of connections between different humans and patterns that emerge uh, within that system, how do we tell a good one from a, a bad one? And so I, I'm proposing to talk about the critical race theory, but try to not limit uh, the exercise to this particular ideology and try to find patterns in it that are more generic. What it is that you find problematic about it? Uh, is it what it does to the individual? Is it the kind of um, sort of the way it adds new members to it, which I suspect you might find coercive? Uh, it's not always an open, free conversation, exchange of ideas that gets people to the conclusion that yes, they agree with this set of principles and ideas. It's, it's, there are these moralistic things. If you're not with us, then you're a bad person, you're a racist, you're a, a, a part of the problem, etc. Um, there is, John McWhorter always often compares it to a religion. I have an interest in cults. I've been uh, looking at some of these systems for, for some years. And uh, yes, you can see some similarities there. And one is, it seems to me, again, from afar, that the cost of leaving the club is prohibitive, or it's, it's one of the ways this system tries to establish itself so that you don't break away. If you break away, then you are a fallen person. You're uh, strayed from everything that is good and you're now engaged with the enemy and so forth. So I'll just leave the floor to you, but the, 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 what I'm hoping to get out of this is an analysis of this thing, but that is not limited to this particular thing and that uh, can be used to find similar issues in other kinds of whether it's social structures or ideologies or, as I say, patterns of uh, thought and behavior. Well, uh, if Cornel West were here, he might say that the project, the intellectual project that you've just proposed to me, which starts with the premise that we're, everything is connected to everything else, which devolves to the observation that that applies to human connections, um, and, and which then poses this normative question of when is it a healthy or an unhealthy aspect of the human connection, and which then gets to, well, let's apply that, Glenn, you talk about race, crim critical race theory, wokeness, uh, anti-racism and whatnot, and you're on a crusade. What is it that you see as healthy and unhealthy and why? But which ask to kind of, abstract to a higher level of generalization about that so that you can apply it to That's other right. areas of human conflict or contestation or whatever. And uh, see, now what uh, Cornel West, a Christian, might say is exactly. That's what the teachings of Jesus, he would say, are meant to do for us to ask what is healthy and what is not healthy about human connection in an abstract way that can apply to a broad range of situations. But I'm not... Offering that is my answer. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just saying the enterprise you're engaged in could be seen uh, playing out in uh, people who think carefully about what their, what their faith commitments are. I'm, I'm using religion maybe in a different sense than McWhorter is using it. I'm not talking about cultism or right, Cornel right. West is as far away from that as he could possibly be. But uh, I, there is a search for some framework of evaluative 
assessment, you know, where I can decide is this right or wrong and what are the, what's the theory of my resolution of that problem? And it seems to me that that's what you posed here. What's the theory of how we resolve the problem of assessing whether or not different aspects of human connection and cooperative uh, inter interaction are healthy or unhealthy? So, yeah, okay, I get the question. <laughs> um, I was thinking about myself as you were talking and asking myself this question, what is it that I really think is unhealthy here? Mm -hmm. And you touched on some of it, hurt, hurting, hurting, the infringement on personal liberty occasioned by this, um, uh, the, the cancel culture, the, the, you know, the, 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 the judgment of the, the racist, the racist, how to be in any, you know, we're, we're so proud of ourselves being so righteous and we're, and we're prepared to exclude those uh, who disagree. And, and it gets very mean as, as John has been known to remark, you know, people says there's mean anti-racism where you, 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 you intend to hurt or destroy based on this, you know, you're hunting witches, you're, you're on a witch hunt. This, uh, so, so there's something about that that rubs me the wrong way, but, but there's a lot there. There is the, um, I think small vision of humanity that makes race, racial claims, racial fealty so high priority in one's assessment of the world. Um, there's a lot wrong, as you point out. Uh, we got our own problems here in the United States. You know, there's a lot that's wrong uh, that uh, it, it is not anti, it's not an anti-black, it's, it's anti-human, you know? I mean, if mm -hmm. I think of incarceration or how police conduct themselves or how much poverty there is or drug addiction or hopelessness, and, you know, uh, whatever, the, 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 this uh, critical race theoretic um, elevation of the claims of injury associated with a history of slavery and racial discrimination above other claims <laughs> Rubs me, rubs me the wrong way, and, and I, I think it's solipsistic and and self-absorbed uh, and small. I, I think it's small. I, I think the that's why I wanted your reaction to our discussion of Russian literature in that Cornell West interview, because I thought I don't know anything really about Russian literature. I've read a few books. That I told you the books that I've read, but uh, Cornell knows a lot more than I do about Russian literature and about the interaction of Russian literature with the rest of European cultural heritage over the last few centuries. But I thought, that's what we should be thinking about, and that's what we should be talking about. Right. And a and hundred other things like that on the same level. I'm reading uh, Chixin Lu, who is a science fiction, Chinese science fiction writer, C-I-X-I-N, I might not pronounce his name right, L-I-U. But he's got a trilogy out there about the three-body problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard about it. It's a, it's a magnificent set of books. Uh, uh, about uh, uh, about uh, particle physics and 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 about uh, speculating about the interstellar intergalactic kind of uh, civilizational contact and whatnot and everything in between. It's it's just you know. And I'm sorry. I, I I'm actually uh, rambling a little bit here. I, I think, but the point I'm trying to make is it's a big world. It's a massive palette of, of, of human endeavor and reflection. And the world grows small with technology now. So to be obsessed about race and to be teaching children, you're white, you're black, you know, the black kids are like this, the white kids are like that. So I, 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 it, it, it rubs me very profoundly the wrong way. I remember my own intellectual awakening. I remember coming off of the south side of Chicago, the Northwestern University in 1970. 71, 72, and I remember some of the books that I read. And, you know, I read classical books and political theory and philosophy. I, I read, you know, uh, I, I was trained in mathematics. I, I, I read, you know, some foundational books in, in you know, Principia Mathematica, that's Russell and Whitehead. You know, I mean, things like that. Um, uh, and, you know, and I, I, I ended up in economics, but I just remember what it felt like 
to be become aware of the vastness of it. And and so this is the opposite of that in my, in, in my mind. And and I it it it's partly motivates me to want to fight mm-hmm. because I think this inward small bore uh uh you know anyway I, I if i go on i'll be repeating myself so so that's part of it uh, part of what i think is wrong with the uh woke anti-racism has to do with uh ab- abdicating responsibility uh for our you know our our plight I, actually i I'm, i want to stop i don't want to repeat my arguments about anti-racism i don't think that's really what you asked me to do um, you, you want an, you want me to generalize from that to um, a, a, a kind of framework for mm-hmm. saying what might constitute unhealthy um, uh, human interaction, and I don't I don't know if I have anything to say. Well, maybe I'll I'll add to it a piece of your own thinking if I get it correctly. Um, you know, you talk about the the difference between you contrast the bias narrative that's prevalent in this like progressive thought that yeah. uh, if anything is uh, problematic uh, with then or black people have any kind of problem, well, it's because the system is uh, skewed against them, and you contrast that with what you propose instead, which is developmental or the development narrative which looks at the development of the human being. And if that human being is, well, we all struggle. We were all going to come across issues. But if we manage to grow through those experiences, then we develop. And um, if for whatever reason, whether it's the family or the society we're in or whatever, if that development is stifled, then we get stuck in a bad situation and and, uh, that can be a cause of uh, disparities within the population and so forth. So the reason this is interesting to me, well, because I'm a human being that I'm trying to grow myself and develop and and mature, and because even some precise, some particular issues that you talk, again, I don't understand, the black, the American black experience is something that I see in documentaries. It's not. It's not a part of my life. But uh, when you talk about some of the ills within that society, I notice that some of them are very similar to some that we are dealing with here, like the fatherlessness problem. I think the majority of my friends uh, grew up in a single mother household. There's a there's a joke that was popular a few years ago. Uh, you know, there's a I think if you poll Russians about gay marriage, uh, you come with negative results. You know, not, not many people are in favor. And that was this joke. It's so weird that Russians are against uh, same-sex parents because the country was brought by same-sex parents. It's the mother and the grandmother. The father's not there. Uh, so, you know, that's whatever. There are these similarities. So that's, that, that's why I'm... Um, you know, it, it, it resonates to a certain extent. And so what I want to connect it to is two things. One are these questions about the development, the, the, the process of maturity. How does an individual mature and how does a society mature and what can help or stifle that process of maturation? And then the other thing is I'll just share uh, that when I, I lived in America for about a year and a half in Houston, and uh, by sort of coincidence, I was engaged with a crowd of these people who thought themselves to be radical left-wing militant revolutionaries and whatnot. This was because my girlfriend at the time felt herself to be a radical left-wing person. And she, but she lived outside of the U.S. for a while. She's American, but lived outside of the U.S. for a while. And when she came back and tried to engage with these people who she thought were her people, she was very, very confused because she was thinking about 
labor movement, about, uh, you know, the relationship between the employer and the worker and yeah. all of that stuff. And these people were very much into race and gender and how you speak and, uh, you know, that whole, yeah. uh, uh, that whole set of issues. And my experience of that, so I was like on their meetings uh, sometimes, I went out to bars with them. And my feeling was that it has nothing to do with any of the things that they actually are talking about. It's not a political project. It reminded me of subcultures that uh, I was a part of or just saw around myself when I was a teenager. When you have these clubs, you like you can get into different clubs based on the music you listen to. You know, when I was in kindergarten and in uh, elementary school, in my region of the uh, of the town, you had to be either a fan of metal music or rap music. Those are the two clubs, and you, you know, choose one, and that's how you form your group that accepts you. That's how you form uh, you you find a group to go against, and. It is not really about the music because you can just listen to the music you like. Those people we hated the most when I was little and when you stop somebody on the street and go, so who you are? Who are you? Are you a metal fan or a rap fan? <laughs> and somebody would say, I just like all kinds of music. Those people <laughs> were the worst because <laughs> they're trying to get out of the game. They're trying to get out of this uh, thing that we derive meaning from. And so I thought that this political subculture that I saw in Houston was exactly of that sort. And so I guess I'm trying to uh, kind of think through this using some of the elements of your thought. If we're talking about human development and maturation and growing up, part a part of what I see problematic with this ideology, but then, you know, on the, this project of abstract and kind of uh, observations from a particular example. Maybe it's not just this. Maybe it's ideology generally. When ideology is, you know, becomes a part of somebody's identity and that's how they belong to a club and that's how they establish relationships with people from other ideologies. Maybe it's a general kind of a thing here. But a problem with what I think Jordan Peterson would call ideological possession, and I don't think that's his term, and maybe Jung or something, but one part is it stifles your development. You don't grow up. You get stuck in a teenage situation where you're just seeking acceptance from uh, one group of people, and you derive some kind of a meaning from going to war with a different group. Does that seem reasonable? Very reasonable. What it reminds me of is uh, the American socialist writer who's been gone a while now, Irving Howe. Irving Howe, he was uh, uh, editor of uh, of uh, The Nation. I'm pretty sure... Oh, no. What, what was that magazine called? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, a, a social, you know, left wing magazine. Anyway, long story short, he wrote an autobiography published in the eighties called "A Margin of Hope," mm-hmm. and in it, he reflects on the early upbringing of the left wing uh, communist uh, intellectual radicals in New York City in the nineteen thirties, which was when he was in college in the nineteen thirties and the nineteen forties. Um, the alcove culture at the City University of New York because they would meet in the alcoves at lunchtime and they would argue politics. And some of them were Trotskyites and, and, and other, you know, flavors of, you know, Marxist, uh, Marxist-Leninist uh, kind of intellectual political thought. But they were always breaking into sects. Mm-hmm. The sect, and then they would break off and they would end up fighting with each other much more than they were fighting with the the capitalists, they were fighting with each other about purity, purity of the doctrine. And of course, with the things that were going on in the Soviet Union uh, with uh, uh, Stalin and, and uh, uh, whatnot, or the f- uh, various, you know, and I know nothing about this. I know very, very little about, about uh, the history of the Soviet Union, but uh, there were uh, echoes in the, in the, um, sectarian divisions amongst the all Marxist uh, uh, 
uh, intellectual cadres of young Americans in the 1930s in New York City. And, it, and what you say re, reminds me of that. And I'm sure that that story can be told over and over and over again. And I, I wonder if you don't see revolutionary movements consuming themselves. I mean, maybe you start with the French Revolution on this. I mean, they end up with uh, right. the radicals cutting each other's heads off. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's probably a story that could be told in every uh, uh, zealot-led revolutionary, you know, transformation of society. A lot of people get marched out of the cities into the, you know, cultural revolution, cultural, yeah, et cetera. This is not a criticism of yours, but a thought that that's, uh, comes out of this part of the conversation. As we are engaged with, so you, you see something in the society, let's say this like uh, CRT movement and the social structures that are, are emerging around it, and you see it problematic. If it is, um, if one of the issues is these are people that are stuck in this teenage kind of relationship with the society at large, with themselves, with each other, with other groups, etc. And if you want to find a way for them to uh, transcend that, to grow up, to uh, get more seriously engaged with the issues that they find problematic, um, should you be fighting the ideology, the movement? Should, should it Should the fight be the metaphor for how you engage with them? Or should you try to, I mean, if you compare it, this is a metaphor, but if you compare it to, you know, a troubled teenager who says, fuck you, fuck this society, I'm, you know, I'm in a punk band. And that's yeah. good and well for a while, but then you want to grow past that. If you just fight the teenager or the music uh, he's engaged yeah. in, this attitude... Is that a way for them to, you know, to help them develop? Probably not. And if I had a daughter who had fallen into a sect and they believe some strange, weird religious doctrine, right? would I argue theology with her? You know what I mean? No, the doctrine is incorrect. No, no, no. The point would be you're allowing your life to be consumed by some arbitrary speculations about some things that... You know, come on, don't don't be a slave to this thing would almost be what I wanted. Think of yourself as a free acting human being and make your own choices in your life. Don't don't be a child, grow up would be what I would want to say. I wouldn't want to argue the particulars of the childishness, you know. Mm -hmm. Um I, I wouldn't descend into the 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 world of those uh ideas in order to refute them. Uh, I, I would ask her to get a grip on her on her life. Um, I, I would appeal to higher ground than the ground of the particular sectarian obsession. Uh, I would appeal to her humanity at a, at a higher level somehow, something like that. I, I mean, you're making me think that this, the fight, you know, and I, I warm to the fight, and I now I have to ask myself, why do I enjoy the fight? Am I really interested in a solution or am I just interested in the fight? Maybe I just like the fight. <laughs> Maybe it makes me feel good to think of myself as superior to these idiots. <laughs> Which is not helpful if I was trying to dispel the idiocy. Uh -huh. It wouldn't be helpful to get consumed with the good feeling I got of knowing that I was smarter than these idiots. <laughs> so it's an it's a it's a really interesting question. Uh, I mean, I think I can give a practical answer to why one should fight CRT uh, because if they get control of the schools, they'll ruin an mm -hmm. entire generation, and there are real things that are at stake here. Or if they so undermine the basis of political cooperation between people of different racial groups in the United States that the republic itself is weakened and unable to govern itself, that's that's something worth. Worth, worth fighting about, I could take a high-minded position and I could say, regardless of the efficacy of my engagement with these people, there is something to be said for standing for the truth. Mm -hmm. 
that that is a matter of you know this is what I associate with Vaclav Havel's call in um, um, the uh, uh, what what is this. Uh, the Czechoslovakia movement. Yeah, no, I know who he is. I'm trying to think of the name of the book, The Power of the Powerless. Yeah. The mm-hmm. essay where he tries to give a theory of d- the dissident and what the role of the dissident is. Who are the dissidents in um, pre-1989 uh, 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 Eastern Europe? Anyway, uh, there's a value in telling the truth regardless of what the consequence of telling the truth is. So I could stand on that. I could stand on, you know, Socrates or somebody. Right. But, um, so practically, I have the Glenn Show. I have people who come on and we talk. John and I have this thing that we do. We're the ghost busters, the woke busters, and, and, and we're the anti, you know, anti-anti-racism people. Um, So should we be just talking to each other and pointing out how idiotic they are? Or should we mainly be talking to them so that other people can see the contrast between these ways of thinking and so that perhaps we can get below the uh, surface level uh, contestation to what might be common ground or what might be more profound disagreements that could be actually constructively engaged, something like that. I, I think there could be something to that. I'm thinking as you were speaking, you know, I propose in this like critique of the fight, uh, it's sort of, you know, there may be an impression of me trying to take a higher ground, but then at the same time, what I said is cond- there's condescension there. There is, uh, you're not treating, if, again, if you were looking at this as an issue of we want to grow ourselves and we want our fellow human being to develop past whatever stage they're in right now, um, there should be a peer kind of quality to it. If you're looking down at somebody and say, well, you're being childish, uh, is that going to, help the child grow up? So th- this is the question that I'm myself struggling with. Again, on part of what I'm trying to do here is to look at these things simultaneously at very different levels. We're talking about the movement and ideology, a social pattern and how we engage with that. And there's, uh, I'm saying now, an immaturity to it. But then there's in a life of a person, you know, I'm trying to, uh, to to develop, I know people who are of my age who seem to be kind of stuck in an earlier way of engaging with the world, and I'm you know really really having all the best intentions for those people. It's like my friends or my relatives that I want to see grow past some childish behavior. And mostly I'm drawing a blank here. Mostly I don't know how to help from the outside. And it's mysterious what it is that you need to do to help yourself, how you help the situation from the inside. And this one question can be, what do we do? So like in your case, you have this system of thought that you're at war with. If you want the people that are caught in that thing to grow past it? What do you, is there a way for you to help them out? How do you uh, help uh, their development? And then you can go further than that and talk about, like, again, in your case, maybe the black American community. In my case, Russians are treated as children oftentimes by the government, by the state. You know, you're, you shouldn't have the ability to choose who your president is going to be. Because if we give you that ability, you're going to make some bad choices. We're going to decide things for you. And then on the part of the people, there's some embracement of that infantile uh, attitude towards their own fate. There is an explanation for why things are bad. Again, I'm trying to look at, you know, in, in on a personal level, you can be 38 
and your life can be a mess. And what you do with it is you bring up all the childhood traumas and the problems you dealt with as a kindergarten and uh, what your mother didn't tell you when you were a little kid and then not fix the situation. It could be all true that you had a hard childhood, but if you're just stuck reliving the hard childhood experiences, well, then you're not growing up. And then on the level of the nation, you can do the exact same thing. Why is Russia not in the best shape? Well, that was a very hard history. Uh, the 20th century, you know, really took a toll. There were a few revolutions in the Civil War and the Second World War, and we lost millions and millions of people in that. And then the Soviet state collapsed and we were unprepared to deal with a new reality. It's all good. That, that's correct. But if you want to improve the situation, you can't be just dealing in explanations of why you're in the situation, you need to start taking responsibility for it. And through that, you, you know, this is my, me, me trying to figure out what it is that growing up is. Through taking that responsibility, you may start to become an adult. But how do you, how that happens within one person? How do I become more of an adult? And how can that be helped uh, with others, whether it's a person or a group or, uh, or a nation, uh, th those questions are very hard for me to wrestle with. Yeah, I don't have any answers for you, Nikita. I'm struck by the parallels as, uh, as I listen to you uh, between Russia and you know, the father fatherlessness point that you made mm -hmm. is one. I'm sure there are many uh, but then this this uh, sense of uh, uh, of a scarred history and, and of a difficult history and and the um, and that's already made a, a, a explanation, but it somehow doesn't satisfy an explanation to remain an adolescent. I mean, there are reasons why the society is fucked up. Uh, so uh, let's blame it on that and and not take responsibility. And, and I very much feel that about the situation of African Americans here, that there's good reason in history to explain it, but it doesn't resolve the question of what is to be done. And uh, it doesn't excuse the passivity and the sense of spoiled fate, uh, matters taken out of our hands. Uh, we, we, we have to just except that this is the way it's going to be. Well, no, we don't. No, we don't. We really are the authors of our, of our fate and of our futures. And uh, at least we have to, if we want to live fully human lives, believe that we are, act as if we were, uh, something like that. Where's the source of your self-respect? Don't delude yourself. You're actually an infant. And you're an infant. You know, the, the, don't... Uh, look away from the reality of your condition. And, and, and the, the thought that I had as I was listening to you is this would be the starting point of a great novel. You know, that the, the right way to engage the problem here is not social scientific. It's, it's humanistic. Mm -hmm. And what That's you want to do is create a complex palette uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a tapestry. You 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 want to weave together all these different, many, many, many strands, and not try to resolve, not try to come to a conclusion. Let it let it speak through itself. You know, like I, you know, I could tell you about Anna Karenina, or I could tell you about uh, crime and punishment, or I could tell you about Pasternak, and you know. But you get the you get the idea. I mean, there are other novelists, but you're Russian, so. You know, and then when you get to the page 630 <laughs> after the end of this magnificent saga and you've been brought into the psychology of the protagonist, you, you, you can see them in their own thinking about their situation, reveal the, the errors and the pitfalls and the snares and the mistakes and the self-delusions and the tragedy and the regret and the... And nevertheless, the humanity of it, and you know, the, you can put hope in your novel. You can, you can make these people suffer and suffer, 
and nevertheless mm-hmm. still have hope. You can do that. And then if you could get anybody to read it, you could teach about life today and tomorrow from the way in which the artist who produced this magnificent uh, uh, text uh, you know, is instructing us. So, so maybe not a direct, maybe not a yeah. direct, maybe an indirect route. We draw people in, but we have to get them to read the novel. Now, we don't have to write the novel because they've already been written, actually. <laughs> have they this is not? Really interesting. This is really interesting. This, uh, I didn't expect you to say this, but I'm thinking like this is kind of what I'm trying to do. Not a novel, mm-hmm. but with the different kinds of uh, artistic things that I am putting out, writing and drawing and weaving them together and trying to make this mosaic of things that I'm dealing with. I mean, my my stuff is very like personal, though I'm trying to make it universal as well. But it's like things that I'm struggling with, experiences that I'm going through, and then how they relate to everything else. And I think there's a quality to what you're doing and generally this podcast as as a medium that is a little like that too, in, in the sense that for an audience member, you're a character in a narrative, you're dealing with things, you're... Uh, I mean, hopefully the best people to follow are people who change their views as they learn more and, you know, develop and actually struggle with the questions that they're talking about, et cetera, et cetera. And through that, uh, through engagement with somebody else that's going through this process, somebody else uh, trying to get through the experience while extracting meaning from it and and letting it change you in a better way and so forth. I mean, I'm certainly as, again, a consumer of this stuff, I'm getting a whole lot of inspiration and food for thought and, uh, you know, things to bring into my own experience in my life that help me grow. Let's use that word. This actually, this, I had this one question that I wanted to ask you. Uh, there was a comment that somebody left. It was a few paragraphs, but I, I remember one phrase from it. It was this like ode to a Glenn Lowry rant. And somebody said, a Glenn Lowry rant is like a Jimi Hendrix solo. It's yeah. like, and then there's like a sequence of these comparisons. Yeah. And I thought there really is something true about that. Um, Meaning, like, what is it about a Jimi Hendrix solo that makes it, st- you know, arrests you and you stand and listen to it? There is, this person is in the moment uh, improvising this thing. It's undeniably Jimmy. It's, it's his relationship with the truth. He's being free in the moment and yet he's, you know, he doesn't know which note he's going to play the next second, but he plays the right note. And it's not, I mean, with with your thing, there's specific content. There's, you know, a rational argument that you're making as well. But that wouldn't be enough. That wouldn't be, um, it would be a very different thing if you were just coldly presenting your argument in this like, uh, you know, bookish fashion and you didn't bring the heart to it. You didn't. I mean, this to me is very interesting, the, the, the relationship between a person and the language as they're engaged in this kind of activity. Um, I guess I'm rambling myself now, but... Now, let me say I'm, something, because mm-hmm. it's so interesting that you recall that comment. I loved that comment, and, and I know now, I don't know where it is. I wonder, I want to find it and make, make sure that I don't lose track of that, of that comment. I must have tweeted it or something, or did something with it. Uh, I'm going to go look for it. But in any case, I loved that comment. Um, I thought it was very flattering. Uh, and, and I do think you're putting your finger on something about the spontaneity and the improvisational character. And virtuosity. Come on. The only way you can play like Jimi Hendrix or like John Coltrane or like Miles mm-hmm. Davis or somebody and can be free in the moment and create these amazing runs 
of impro improvised music and never hit a wrong note is that you have absolute mastery and command over the medium. Right. It, it, is, it is a part of you. And uh, you don't think about it. It is second nature, but you've spent many, 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 many hours practicing. You've practiced scales and scales and scales and scales and, you know, whatnot. And, and you've, you've made yourself a master over the instrument. Uh, and then you've freed your spirit and it, it comes through and it, it I, you know, I was thinking that. Uh, I was thinking as you were talking, when I read a speech, you know, write out the text mm -hmm. and read it. And I'm, I'm a good writer and th the sentences are all very well crafted. It is a flat performance. If I turn the page down or lose my text and am forced to actually speak extemporaneously, it is a vital, you know, much more uh, uh, effective uh, uh, performance. And this has happened to me on, on more than one occasion. The Q&A after the reading of the speech is always the best part of, of mm -hmm. the meeting. Where, when people ask questions and I respond extemporaneously. So, so um, I, I, think, I think that the, the Glenn rant, um, the passion, just the analytical argument alone wouldn't, wouldn't be enough. And then fusing it with personality. So, and, and this becomes seductive. I don't want to fall in love with my image you know, and narcissistically, uh, I don't want to become obsessed about what other people are seeing when, when they look at me. I, I want to somehow not be seduced uh, into an, an inflated uh, sense of my, my own self-importance. Um, you know, uh, but but I also I, I also don't don't want to not know who not not know who I am, uh, and I, I I'm I hesitating I'm stumbling here because I, I don't want to lapse into self to celebrating to celebrating myself which yeah, is what you invite you you invite me to say I'm a great man, <laughs> uh, I'm you know the genius of Glenn Lowry shows through in his rant you know that kind of thing and other people should say that well about me. it's it's not just that though uh, there is the the what's interesting here for me is to try to understand what it is. It's coming back to my question. What is going on? What is going on when uh, a rant is happening or a Jimi Hendrix solo is happening? And I think, I forget if I said this when we started recording or right before we started recording, but I listened to a part of your conversation with Cornell uh, last night and he said this thing that part of the beauty of what's uh, what, yeah. of what you're engaged in and he's engaged in is that you are trying to have a relationship with the truth and you're going to try to uh, make each other accountable. If you stray from it, he'll let you know. If you notice some hypocrisy in what he's doing, he, you let him know. And I think this thing about being in the moment, not knowing what you're going to say in the half minute or which note you're going to play, but really trying to stay authentic and kind of letting it happen because you're letting go some of the control, right? When you're in that process, you're not thinking it through carefully. You may say something that you're going to regret. Uh, I think there is, this is why it's so interesting to me. There are other people like that. Uh, actually, my example, my go-to example is somebody from, you know, this other field that, that is of interest of mine, a part of my life is the psychedelic thing. There's this guy, who was this guy, Terrence McKenna, who is the best speaker, they call him bard sometime, of this psychedelic view of the world. And he would speak on end. And my experience with him was, uh, when I first started listening to him, I had this feeling that his, his language is too complicated for me. I, you know, my, my English skills are not good enough. Uh, but then I would listen to a half hour, an hour, an hour and a half, and I realized that I understood everything that he said. It's just the way that he speaks is, um, the way he uses language is almost like a different language for me and that I needed to learn. And there is something very enriching in this, in, in getting to sort of develop your relationship with language as 
medium. And then there's something of great, great value for me in listening to people like you, like Terrence, uh, Jordan Peterson could be a different example of, uh, you know, a person who can speak. Um, I will say there's this. something. I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I was just uh, saying that there's something in this, the fact that you're in the moment, that you're, you're making yourself vulnerable, sort of, by not controlling exactly how it's going to unfold the next minute is going to unfold you're you know you 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 have the skill to not let it get away from you to not just ramble on and say something you don't mean but you are making yourself vulnerable because you may say something that that is not the, the perfect thing to say or whatever or that will invite some attack or something and well, i think there is you were talking about this novel that can help the reader you know, develop, grow up because the character is struggling. There's something in you deciding to go on and uh, say, you know, let go of this control and and see what it is that you're, maybe say something that you didn't know that you mean, you know, say something that you you didn't know that you think because you're improvising here. Uh, that helps me as an audience member, that helps me to try to develop the same kind of quality in myself. Sorry, <laughs> I thought you no, took no, too long. It's but. your show, you know. <laughs> I, I was just going to say there's improvisation. I don't know if the music analogy goes through completely here, but mm-hmm. there's also, at least in my case, I know often some of my best rants, my best extended statements in the podcast where it becomes the perfect clip because it's, you know, three minutes of extended uh, speaking about something with passion and with insight uh, and eloquence, are spontaneous and improvised, yes, but are resting on a foundation of thought that has gone on before where I'm out riding my bike and I'm thinking about the thing. And, you know... Not the specific phrases or words, but just the kind of idea. I have this idea, or if I'm talking with John McWhorter and I've got a notepad in front of me, and I might write down three different points, and then that could become the basis for an extended statement later on. It gives a little bit of framework to it. I expect that these jazz musicians do have a vocabulary of phrases and of extended things that they they can then import into the... Uh, particular performance, you know, because they do have mastery over the technique. Uh, So maybe the analogy isn't as weak as I initially thought. But in other words, you come prepared. Even though your performance is spontaneous, you come prepared. You do your homework, yeah. Okay, I think I'll end here because I know you need to go soon. And then the other things that I have written down as questions or themes to offer will maybe take too long to uh, to address properly. If you want to have another conversation, I'm open to that. Oh, I would be very happy to, for sure. Okay, well then for now, thank you so much for this one. This really, uh, that's, a, that's a step for me. That's uh, in my project of figuring out what's going on and what has to be done and whether, you know, what role it is that I'm trying to play here. Uh, I'm far from any kind of conclusions on any of those questions, but uh, this is definitely a step forward. You're going to post this conversation? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, so you should send me a link. I will, I will. Because I don't subscribe to the channel, maybe I should be subscribing to the channel. Thank you so much, Glenn. Okay, bye-bye.